Welcome, everybody. We will have a time to breathe a little bit during the PowerPoint presentation today. So we are here for this. This is our activity today. And where did this seven week series come from? Uh, I've been at, back at WCC four and a half years this time. And the first week I was here, I would say, I started to hear <clears throat> like, what more can we do? What more can we do? as a church in response to the world's needs. Specifically, I started meeting with the green team, WCC's green team, and some of you here are on the green team. And there was talk about legislation, uh, federal and state level legislation. Uh, sh should we support legislation as a green team, as a church, as individuals? Should we even tell the congregation that there is environmentally related legislation out there <clears throat> that people should learn about and consider. And I said, you know, that would be a good thing for the church as a whole to discuss our relationship to public policy advocacy. Do we, don't we, when do we do it? How do we do it? And so on. It has continued to emerge in the four and a half years that I've been here. And I've said to leaders, like, I think we need to talk about this. I think we need to talk about this. Let's talk about this. So we're talking about this. But we're talking about it through a very broad lens, which is what is God calling us to do as church? Which is not the most poetic title for a series, <laughs> but it's very clear, I hope. What is God calling us to do as church? This is a broad question, and we're going to approach it broadly, and we have seven weeks to do that. But part of it, especially as we get to uh, the fifth, fifth, sixth, and seventh weeks, uh, we will uh, drill down at a more local level about our response as a congregation to the world's needs. Uh, there has also been, in the last four and a half years, uh, the uh, development of an anti-racism ministry at WCC. Uh, Ann Pope is chair or co-chair? Yeah, uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> of this effort. And our burgeoning partnership with Bethel Baptist Church in Chicago Heights. And those initiatives also beg the question, what are we doing? And what can we do? Uh, are we content with what we're doing? Do we want to think about other options? And then last year when <clears throat> Sorry, toward the end of the spring when we started gathering ideas for spiritual enrichment, uh, this particular unit uh, came about somewhat as a tie to the last 17 weeks we did, which was just looking at the Christian faith as adults. What's there, what's not? But we didn't drill down very far into the church and its mission. So in a sense, these seven weeks address the church. Church with a capital C, not just a congregation, but the church globally, and going back the 2,000 years that the church has been in existence. What's, what, what's our purpose in terms of not just within our walls, but beyond our walls? There has developed, of course, in the last uh, dozen years or even 15 years, going back to the murder of Trayvon Martin, a growing awareness that it's important for our country to come to terms with its racial history. Uh, this has been even more poignant, I think, during the uh, pandemic time as uh, George Floyd's murder has uh, sort of been very central, central to our nation's focus. And I think climate change and climate crisis just continues to be in front of us as an urgent matter not only for us as individuals, but as church. What do we do as church in response to these, this existential threat? Um, sorry. So I think the question before us is what can we do, not only as individuals, but again, as church, as a collective body. And I want to be upfront and clear with you. I have 
experience with this. Uh, my last two congregations got very involved in organized efforts with other houses of worship, Jewish, Muslim, Baha'i, and of course, Catholic and all manner of Protestants, even some conservative Protestants, in coming together and asking, what can we do for our community? Especially in terms of advocacy. Um, and we'll, we'll, that'll be part of our seven weeks together is distinguishing <clears throat> between advocacy ministries and justice ministries. So that is yours truly and his purple Lenten clergy shirt <laughs> leading a group on a prayer rally, a prayer event on the property in Arlington Heights where I served. This property had been identified by uh, local congregations and housing activists in Arlington Heights as a possible location for a supportive apartment building for people with mental illness who are otherwise without homes or living in their parents' basements or couch surfing from place to place, but not, not having their own apartment building. Um, this is a supportive permanent housing program sponsored by federal dollars uh, from low-income housing dollars, tax credits, and so on, uh, so that people with mental illness, and now it's actually all disabilities, uh, it can't, a, a, a project like this cannot be specific to a particular disability, it has to be all disabilities. Back then, just 10 years ago or so, it was specifically for people with mental illness. But there would be a live-in person to support uh, the residents there, to remind them of appointments, help them navigate public transportation, and so on. So housing activists and, housing, uh, and houses of worship in Arlington Heights came together to say, we want one of these in our community. As you can imagine, some neighbors were not very uh, excited. Well, they were excited, but not supportive. <laughs> <laughs> So we had to go to the town mothers and fathers and the newspapers and the courts and to the neighbors and work this as best we could. Uh, this particular project did not happen. But after I left, I don't think those two things are related. After I left, a project was built in Arlington Heights and another one in Mount Prospect. Um, I would like to think it's because we organized people yes. the first time. And even though it wasn't successful the first time, those people were still there, and those houses of worship, too. Now, the purpose of these seven weeks is educational. It's just to give you information so that our congregation going forward has a common basis of knowledge. We're not here to make any decisions. This is uh, not a decision-making body, so put your hands down. <laughs> <laughs> And because this does have import, potentially, for the Mecca Congregational Church, uh, Jeff and I both thought it's important to notify, consult with the church council. So we did that December, January, and even at this month's meeting. So this is a spiritual question. And this is where I'd like us to slow down and just ponder the question for a moment. And I'd like to ask you your feedback. What, and including those of you who are on Zoom, what, what do you think about the question? What, does, what questions does the question uh, percolate within you? Or responses? Well, what can we do um, to help people on various issues of importance that would be more equalizing in society? How do we work with others to care for each other? When we're in love God. Of... Yes, please. And love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody else? What does this I I mentioned that I think this is a spiritual question. What is God calling us to? Yes. Well, as you said in your introduction, I assume you're approaching this from the capital C standpoint as opposed to, say, Micah 6 versus 8, which is more personal to 
uh, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That I think is, you could expand that to include this, but I think that's a more personal thing, what you could do as an individual. Uh, but I think if you don't do that as an individual, then you can't go beyond <laughs> to the capital C thing. Uh, my thank you. Thank you. Hi, for me, um, also focusing on language is just simply the word do, and it's putting beliefs into action. What does that look like in the world? Well, I'm getting to the age where I finally yeah. thinking about it, and I think it takes great personal kind of commitment to what is needed, you know, what you perceive. And so I think it's a mental uh, experiment almost to answer that question. It's a, it's a very far reaching thing. And then it becomes something that you can, you can really go for, yeah. That having been in leadership a lot of my time here, that my own focus has ended up becoming more and more inward directed because I've been uh, more focused on how to strengthen and grow this institution, which allows for the possibility of us doing things as church, but hasn't made me be externally motivated. And perhaps that's been part of the flaw of Western Protestantism generally. We haven't been as externally motivated, and perhaps that would have been more engaging to those who have rejected us. Yeah, I mean, as I'm speaking as a pastor here, not as your leader today, uh, people get to know a church or house of worship in their community because that house of worship is involved in the community. And it's often presented, it's, it's, it's say, oh, that's an interesting place because look what they do here, here, and here. Yeah. Well, of course, this church has a huge history of doing things within the community. Mm -hmm. right, that's, that's pretty much what we're known for. I guess the question is that we stop doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think some of us in leadership have worried that, yes, we've done a lot of these things, and yet they haven't produced the kinds of outcomes that we had hoped for in terms of, of growth of our community, of our polity. Um, so, you know, we can draw 350 people when we have the cred people here. We can um, you know, go out and do mission trips or whatever, but they don't seem to be engaging um, the, you know, the next generation to come and join us because they want to do the same things. And so that's been very challenging to those of us in leadership as to what to do next that might resonate better. Yeah. Thanks. Thank All right. Um, we're gonna I like the idea of church beyond our walls and holding hands with other churches in our area and other denominations. I love our partnership with Hakafa, and it seems like that's sort of flipped under, but um, I think we've all maybe been taken by Biden's working with the rest of the world, and I think in the same manner we can work with other churches. And houses of worship. And houses of worship, yep. absolutely. Yep. That's my go-to term for non-Christian uh, <laughs> uh, institutions. I think that one of the big issues or challenges is common sense. And, and in the sense that a lot of things that we see are people just yelling at each other and, and that there's no common floor. Um, and to the extent that this church could actively reach out to the different points of view, including the churches and, and the different faiths and so forth, but get into it and and start building some common sense coming, you know, but but just actively saying we're going to talk about this issue, this issue, this, this issue with with the Jewish people, with the Muslims, with the these and that, and and make that a public thing. I think that would do a great service to starting to build, rebuild common sense or, or something like that. Yeah. So I just, I just want to put that forth as a, as a possible third vector besides global warming and, um, you know, anti-racism, but mm -hmm. because I think common sense is a, is a, is, is fractured and, 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 you know, there's a lot of cultish behavior and because people have kind of lost their, their framework. 
So I just want to put that out there. I, I think it would be nice if all of the churches and to start small in Winneka picked up one idea. I had an idea, no more guns on the Lori Dan day. <laughs> I got nowhere, nowhere with any church. They could have all put up some banner. And just this unity would be nice. Thank you. All right. The question, what is God calling us to do as church implies other questions. Uh, drilling down deeper, the why, the when, the how, the who. And I want to acknowledge that at the beginning, that one question leads to many other questions. <laughs> Here's what we're doing these seven weeks. As always, these are our sort of guiding principles, I hope, open minds, open hearts. Curiosity is so important. It's like, what did you mean by that? <laughs> Say more. The, the therapist's question, say more. <laughs> always mutual respect, and um, I hope we always have time for lots of interaction, comments, questions. We pause. Before we drill deeper here, especially a Hebrew Bible and other groups, let's just take a breath. So again, the first three Sundays are roots. Why pay attention to our roots? I, I really offer this question to you. By roots, I'm talking about everything that makes our tradition a tradition. Symbols, history, liturgy and ritual rites, narratives, scripture, concepts. Does it matter? Uh, is, is this, uh, we're talking about roots of, of our, our church as a whole, rather than individuals. The, the, uh, That's right. Like, uh, different, different roots. Right. Quite, quite away from that. Thank you for the question. When I say roots here, I'm talking about roots in the Christian tradition. And I'm really asking you: Does it matter? Some of the roots. I think some of our roots are based in uh, love, charity, forgiveness. Indeed, these are some of those important concepts. When you think of the roots of our church, uh, we also need to include the roots way back into New Testament times and what we call in many ways liturgy now probably grew just out of a sense of organizing one's thoughts so nothing got left out. And so some churches have a more liturgical, i.e. Catholic with Episcopal format. Others uh, found that restrictive, but it comes out with the personalities of the people involved. So it's always flexible, but the group come back to a need to organize and leave nothing out. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I have the impression that sometimes people want to get to their own opinions first. <laughs> and that's part of being a human, right? Is that we just, you know, can't we just talk about what's going on and what we want to do? But as a pastor, let me try to argue for the importance of roots. Because for one thing, Christianity did not emerge from nothing. We emerged from someplace, a very rich panoply of resources and history. Secondly, it provides something that we have in common. In addition to being human beings and living in the 21st I almost said 22nd century, <laughs> 21st century, we have common roots. And I know some people, some people in the circle today, some grew up uh, in the Christian faith, others did not. And we've all kind of wandered here and there, I'm sure. However, when we worship together, 10 to 11, every Sunday, we draw on symbols, common, shared symbols, values, <clears throat> concepts, narrative or scriptures. Uh, we hear them. We argue with them. <laughs> but we share them. 
And rather than just saying, well, what do I think we should do? It's good to plumb the depths of these resources. And we have the season of Lent to do that. When we were pausing a moment ago, uh, let's remember that the season of Lent is a time to pause, to just take a breath and to reflect and remember that we come from someplace. We inherited this tradition and it's a tradition that needs to work for us today. It needs to be reinterpreted for today, but it's a shared tradition. I'm grateful for it, not only because it's provided 38 years of employment, for me, <laughs> but because in my heart, in my mind, it does guide me from day to day. And it's something that I can go to another country, walk into a Christian church, hear the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we say, yes. I don't even know that person, but we share these stories. But to me, it's just powerful. And I, I hope that you'll get something out of these three weeks. This is today's uh, agenda. It's an aggressive agenda. I found a great article in an actual book. And this is the book. And this is the author of the, art of the article. This is the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. Um, there's a similar looking book up here. That's the old Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. This is 2007. Abingdon Press completely rewrote all their articles, we added new articles uh, 15 years ago. And the article on ethics in the Old Testament was written by this fellow who is Dean Emeritus at Wesley in Washington. It's a United Methodist seminary, very well respected seminary on the uh, campus of American University. And he's a professor of Old Testament, now retired and also an elder or pastor in the United Methodist Church. And when I read this article, I thought, that'll work at WCC for this purpose. Now, it's gonna be challenging here because part of his thesis is, you can't look at any one text in the Hebrew Bible. By the way, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, all the same thing. Yeah. You can't look at one text and say, that's it. Now I understand the ethics of the Old Testament. <clears throat> oh, were it so simple. <laughs> he reminds us as a Bible scholar that the Hebrew Bible was spoken, written down, edited, passed on, edited again, rearranged in order until soon after the time of Jesus, when the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible were pretty much set the way they are today, which is really a long time, 2,000 years. And yet there was a process. So many people wrote it, many cultures, many political dynamics are in play. And so we need to look into each of those anytime we look at something with ethical context in the Hebrew Bible. But that means it's, it's work. <laughs> Who wants to do that? Um, I like his quote here on the right. We cannot create a typical or complete history of ancient Israelite ethics. We catch glimpses <clears throat> of the moral world behind the text of the Old Testament, with each glimpse reflecting a different strata of Israelite life or a different moment in the experiences of Israelite history. This says two things. One is it's complex. The other thing is this is an ethical text. As difficult as it is to, to pull out ethical content in the Hebrew Bible and how impossible it is to say, this is it. Finally, here, here's the answer to how we should live in the world. Still, the text that's been handed down to us has a moral core and center. That's the it's sort of bad news and the good news. So the, the text, though, the scribes of that text over 2,000 years um, were pretty good. And uh, we know that because up to the time of the Essenes, who probably wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls and hid them in the caves of Qumran, those texts compared very well in the 90 percentile of accuracy uh, over a 600 period of time to the earliest texts that we as humans had found 
until then. So they they did a really good ethical job of of conveying that story throughout time. Yeah, thank you. What what Jim's saying is what I think most pastors and Bible scholars agree with is that yes, there are dueling texts or manuscripts sometimes, right? And you'll see that in the footnotes of the English Bibles. Like, this is what we think it says. However, footnote, other texts say this. However, what Jim's saying is right. There is remarkable agreement about uh, between 95 and 100% of the text of the Hebrew Bible. It's just remarkable. Likewise, in the New Testament, there is one, there is now one received scholarly Greek version of the New Testament. There's enough, in other words, there's enough agreement among New Testament scholars that they've all come together and said, here's our best collective thinking about what all the texts agree is sort of a complete version of the New Testament. It doesn't solve every question, but there is remarkable uh, integrity of the text of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Here's an example of how the Hebrew Bible sometimes doesn't agree with itself about ethical matters. There, you can find entire books of the Hebrew Bible that emphasize the uniqueness of Israel and God's call to Israel to be a people set apart. Different from all those other pagans, heathens, Right? Those, and Ezra and Nehemiah are really good examples of that. The people of Israel were in uh, exile in Babylon in the 6th century. When they came back to Jerusalem, they really felt like they had to draw the wagons close. They forbade intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews. And they really uh, restricted settlement of non-Jews in the land of Israel. There, there's an ethical voice, right, toward exclusion, all right? So if you don't like immigrants and foreigners, you've got a couple books of the Bible kind of on your side, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And then there's Jonah and other books. Jonah is called to go and preach to Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Nineveh, a foreign city, and to bring good news of God's redemptive love, and forgiveness, and hope. To Nineveh. It suggests that God's good news and presence is available to all. So if you're looking for an ethic to support inclusion, go to Jonah. Now this sounds hopeless, like if I want to argue for this, I'll go here. And if I want to argue for this, I'll go here. But what it suggests, according to uh, Bruce uh, Birch, is that the Hebrew Bible is a Bible for conversation about ethics. Wow. You won't find a very clear answer to a lot of your pressing questions, but what you will find is a lot of different voices and perspectives, just like a group of people. <laughs> and he says that is, um, that's an advantage that the Hebrew Bible gives us. And it points to Maybe the purpose of all those people who preserved the text and passed them down, passed them down, passed them down to us. The purpose was to say, just as these voices are talking to each other, we also need to talk to each other about the ethical challenges before us now. And we need to really hear why Ezra and Nehemiah were saying what they said about drawing the wagons close. We need to hear the story of Jonah as a story of God's love for, for all peoples, even the, the non-covenant people. Uh, this is called canonical criticism. This is where I was afraid I might be going too deep here for you, but I think you can handle it. Canonical criticism is not criticism like we don't like something. It's criticism like literary criticism, a way of looking at a text. You can look at a text, including the, the Bible, in many different ways. Uh, Bruce Birch and others are in this canonical criticism camp that looks at the text as a whole 
and appreciative of the fact that editors shaped it in a certain way and that people wrote it down in a certain way. They didn't write down other things. They arranged it in a certain way in a final form that was passed on and passed on and passed on. And that this, this love of the text that started with the text originally and then as it was shaped and passed down and reinterpreted and reinterpreted, we need to honor the fact that our ancestors are speaking to us. That's what canonical criticism is, in gratitude for their voice, which doesn't mean that they had all the answers, they lived in a different time, right? But they speak to us lovingly and say, we have something of value for you here. Uh, we hope, we hope you appreciate it. Um, this is uh, Bruce Birch's approach, and I think it's a good way of approaching scripture generally. Um, sorry for all the words there. They say no, no more than two words on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, I guess I violated that. <laughs> Three quotes here by Bruce Birch. Such a use of the canon. Canon means sort of the text as a whole. <clears throat> the, what we have. Hebrew Bible. Such a use of the canon requires honest and critical reading of the text and not a superficial imposition of some moral system formed outside of the text and forced upon the canon. <clears throat> so what is morality for a lot of people? Sex. The do's and don'ts. Uh, it's not so much about honoring the uh, the needs of marginalized communities. <clears throat> uh, it's not about questioning business practices. It's not about whether we should go to war or not. It's who you're sleeping with, who you're not. If that's your moral system and you come to the Old Testament with that moral lens, you will find plenty to keep you busy. <laughs> but you will miss, you will miss all that other rich community material about how do we make a better society that honors all people so people have housing and education and respect for human rights and so on. So that first point is be, take the whole text objectively as far as possible rather than bringing your issues to the text. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the current this being done uh, is this abortion question. Um, uh, it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's very much like the examples that you gave already. It's, uh, the people who are who are making their own decisions and saying that it's biblical, it has a biblical base, and uh, people people of faith have just really different views. Uh, of that issue. Yep. In, a, in the previous series, I, I quoted uh, William Sloan Coffin, I think it was, who said that most people use the Bible the way a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. Yeah. 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 Reverend Childs was another canonical criticism guy. Bruce Birch says, beware of that tendency yeah. because you will miss what you're not looking for. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second point here he makes is don't look for the simplistic moral template, sort of it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, however, the Hebrew Bible has nonetheless proven to be uh, a source of insight drawn from many witnesses that has distinctly, distinctively shaped generations of communities that claim these texts as scripture. Who, who, who are those communities? It's, it's Jews and Christians all around the world <clears throat> for thousands of years. There's, there's, there's a richness here that we can honor. And lastly, uh, it may be well, it may well be that the canon invites readers into a process of moral discernment more than into a ready-made set of moral rules, norms, and conclusions. Yeah. It's the process that is suggested by this diverse text we have. I know this is, um, it's not maybe telling us how to find ethics in the Hebrew Bible, but we're, we'll get there. <laughs> <clears throat>
Um, so for Birch and other canonical criticism professors, uh, community is key. Community is key. So consider this. Our Hebrew ancestors were not writing to individuals, for individuals. They were writing as a community for their community. And then people who locally <coughs> kept this material were passing it on to communities, communities, communities. Okay. Communities are comprised of individuals, of course. But when people gather to listen, to hear, to love, to act in the world, we do it from our social nature. So this is a bias of the canonical criticism movement that is written by communities for communities. The canon itself, he says, is testimony to the intention of the text as we have it now to transcend its originating social context, whatever they were, and undertake the dynamic task of community formation through succeeding generations. Communities that receive these texts are going to take them in different ways, but community norms and values do develop, right? So the liberal Protestant American 20th century, 21st century way of receiving these texts is different from a Roman Catholic community, from a Roman Catholic community in another country, from the way African Christians may or African American Christians may. And nonetheless, uh, community values and norms develop based on these texts. Birch's summary comment before delving into the text itself is therefore Hebrew Bible ethics arise from communities in their own moral context, preserved and passed along to subsequent communities for their own moral reflection, decision making, and action as communities. If communities can act and don't, that's an action. Just like individuals, right? To not act, to not use a voice when you can, is to make a, a moral decision. And, and Birch says, this is implied in the text, a text of communities for communities. Now we happen to be a community of faith here. Yeah. And I thought this is as good a time as any to put in a reminder that just as the Israelites consider themselves to be a covenant community in the congregational tradition, I know a lot of us weren't raised congregational, but nonetheless, we are in a church with that name. We have a covenant like congregational churches have always had. We also share with all the ancient Israelite communities, this sense of covenant. Covenant is about relationship. It's about community. <clears throat> the covenant stone in there <laughs> says, but we walk together in all God's ways. I think it just takes the, those, line, those words, walk together in all God's ways, because that's a good summary of covenant theology. It said, yes, we are individuals, but we are individuals who are committed to a common God and to one another. And to this institution. That's that's really profound. That it takes salvation out of the when I die, I'm going to go to heaven <laughs> definition. And it says we are all in it together. I, I have I have that same feeling when we uh, we go to the church services together, and especially afterwards when, when a lot of us are talking with each other. Well, that is that is a, a community, and it is a gift to me. I, I, I think to everybody, but I really feel that that, that is as much a gift as the uh, the music, and I like music, and the sermons are, and I like the sermons. That, that's that's really, really important to me. Just being being with people, uh, yep. who have pretty much the same. I think well, we should not share this common values and so on. Yeah. So the first point that Birch makes really when he gets into the text itself is <clears throat> we need to look at what's relational in each text. Beginning with the most important relationship, our relationship with the holy. 
I always, we talked about this recently in this circle. I am reluctant sometimes to use the word God because God has a lot of baggage. <laughs> so I put up a picture here from the Hubble telescope as another way of relating to ultimate things, the universe. What's our purpose? Why are we here? For one thing, it's just awesome that we are because there are so many reasons why life on Earth <laughs> might not have developed at all. And here we are. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And so ethical reflection begins with awe and wonder, just that we have consciousness. And Birch says that all moral reading of, of the Bible, Hebrew, Hebrew Bible in this case, begins with a simple relaxing into the joy of living in God's presence. It's spiritual. Ethical work is not first about do's and don'ts, which is people like the Ten Commandments, you know, 10 fingers, 10 toes, easy to remember. But what's the basis of it? The basis is awe, mystery, joy, delight from the very fact that we have each other, that we have life. You know, so it's like, when we think about it, we should tingle. I think it's uh, respect. Like communities to me are, do you live in a desert or in the mountains or in the Arctic? And and there are rules like in the Arctic, uh, the animals can understand what you're talking about. So you have to have respect. And then the rules go on and on and on. They're very distinct. But what it really boils down to is preserve the animals so you have enough to eat for a hundred years. And these, th this is uh, this is what you're talking about to me. So ethical systems very quickly become rigid rules. Yes. And Birch is trying to say that neither the Bible nor common sense, common sense, <laughs> uh, um, promotes rule setting, really, as a good means of promoting ethical life. Because there's so much in our daily decision making where there isn't a simple rule. <laughs> it requires deeper discernment. Mm -hmm. And discernment with others. Like, what do you think I should do here? No. So, um, again, this is principally about relationship with God, knowing, trusting, and so on. Um, he makes the point that before the Ten Commandments, before the Exodus story itself, you know, Charles and Heston, <laughs> Prince of Egypt, parting the Red Sea, before all that, Birch points out that God revealed God's intimate self to Moses, revealing the personal name of God. God has a personal name in the Hebrew Bible. It's not pronounceable, and Jews even today take great caution in not pronouncing it. They may write it in four letters, yud ba, yud hey, but it's not spoken because that's God's personal name. But to Moses, before any of this whole, let's make a nation <laughs> together, uh, let me free you from slavery, before any of that was a self-revealing, where God said, this is who I really <laughs> am. And if we're, if we're going to be in relationship here for the next many thousands of years, let me tell you, this is my heart. My heart is, I am who I am. Also translated, I will be who I will be. I mean, what kind of God is this? A, a God who apparently wants to be in relationship with us. And Birch says this leads to the concept called imitatio dei, the imitation of God. So you, you want to be like this God who is willing to reveal at great cost God's self to us <coughs> and free us from slavery in Egypt and do all these other great things that God does for us. And so a lot of the legal material in the Hebrew Bible is not do this because I tell you, it's do this because I love you. And because you promised to love me, we're like married. <laughs> I don't give you a rule book in a marriage. I, I give you my heart. 
And I hope that you respond to me the way I hope I want to respond to you in self-sacrificial love. So Deuteronomy 10, God executed justice for the orphan and the widow and loves the strangers. Therefore, it doesn't say therefore, but I hear it. You shall also love the strangers. I'm a God who specializes in the neglected. So you go forth and do likewise. Be like me. Leviticus, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Jesus also said, be perfect for your father in heaven is perfect. It's the same. Jesus is echoing Moses here, basically. Uh, we serve a righteous God. Let's be righteous. It begins, though, in this sense of relationship. And I'm sure you want to check out every verse of Leviticus 19, but time doesn't allow. But each of those ethical admonitions to, to love the stranger, to welcome the foreigner, to make sure you don't lie and cheat in your daily business ethics, each of those in Leviticus 19 ends with, why? Because I am the Lord your God. And it's not because, and I'm telling you, it's because remember, remember, we're together. We have a relationship. So uh, Birch says that obedience uh, to God's righteous will is not blind obedience done in fear. This is not about fear. It's rooted in trust of, of a God who is always on our side, faithful, who will never leave us, who will see us through, the God of hope, the God of forgiveness and love, et cetera, et cetera. And to the Ten Commandments point, Julie Ray's. Birch's beautifully points out that the Ten Commandments doesn't just start number one, number two, number three. It starts with this reminder. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of slavery. Again, the relationship precedes the ethics. And then therefore, commandment number one, number two, number three. So Birch's conclusion is obedience is not to an arbitrary power, but, but grows out of an enduring relationship in a life lived by the community in the presence and purpose of God. And again, there's this tension in ancient in the Hebrew Bible between the universal and the particular. God calls this particular people, the Israelites, the Jews, to a special relationship. But that relationship is not a relationship of privilege so much as it is a relationship of responsibility. Why does God choose Israel? It's not because God loves them more. Because God want, needs a people to do God's work on earth for all people. So you hear this tension between the particular and the universal. And, and even in the creation story, the creation story precedes all this other covenant uh, development and specificity of the nation of Israel. It's a story of God's universal creation of all people. And there's a reason why the Hebrew Bible editors put it first, Genesis 1, to emphasize that God's love for Israel does not mean God ignores everybody else. In fact, God's love is universal because God created all humans and declared them good. Genesis 1, 31, I think it is. And in the story of Eve and Adam, gave them moral agency. God is not heavy-handed, but freeing us to make our own decisions and mistakes. <laughs> and in Psalm 8, uh, we are reminded that we are the crown of God's creation. What are your responses, especially, what, what have you heard today? Uh, some need to go and do various worship activities. Uh, what, if, how does this, what you experience today, how does it begin perhaps to answer this question, what is God calling us to do as a church? Well, Jeffrey, um, thank you. I can say this is a, a good start to, uh, to this conversation here. A reminder that um, we can and should do as a group, as a community, the things that we want 
to see in the world individually. And so just, and you're reminding me of uh, our discussion of Reinhold Niebuhr, individuals and organizations. We're blessed to have a very democratically run organization here, this church of ours. And so I hope it'll be uh, a smooth process into getting together, discussing, discussing, and deciding some manifestations of our individual desires to make the world a better place that we can actually do as a group. One of the things I was struck by all the way through what you were talking about all the way this morning was the power of thousands of years of individuals struggling with these with it with exactly what we're talking about, struggling with the ideas, but also feeling that that's incredibly important, the ideas of ethics and morality. And that you know it's really critical. I think for all of us, for human beings to continue to struggle individually, but more, more importantly, as a community with these issues. And, you know, one thing I learned about ethics is uh, it's not evil versus good that's the difficult part. <laughs> that's easy. It's when you have to choose between two goods right. or between two evils. That's when you really need the wisdom of Solomon and you need prayer. And you need the community and all the resources of the community, including our ancient resources. What, one more comment, then we'll take a break. Uh, the, the one thing that I that I see in common from all of the stories that we, we we read in the Bible and so on is uh, the importance of love. I mean, the love is the basis of even even our our plans. Uh, which you're suggesting that we put together here. So what, what we're calling us to do as church is do things uh, to members of our uh, greater community based on our love for others.